Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 39. And uh, you've got some bulletin, uh, some fill in the blanks in your bulletin today. So if you want to fill, uh, you know, play along at home or here in your pew, that'd be great. Chapter 2 of Luke, starting at verse 21. We'll read that here in just a moment. But uh, as we get into today's scripture, I want to reflect on something that perhaps brings you great joy. It brought me great joy, especially during this Christmas season. Uh, those wonderful little joys in each and every one of our lives. Children. Children. I was thinking about how children seem, maybe it was just my perspective, but they seemed a little extra cute and adorable this year, especially as they're frolicking around the store, just being just doggone adorable. Didn't take too long this last week. They heard a couple crying and whining. But that You know, that's normal. But there's just some really cute interactions God has, has uh, allowed me to have with some families at the store uh, over the last month. And it's been really nice. But as parents, we care for their needs, right? We kiss their boo-boos. We show our affection. And we model the behaviors that we want to see in them. <clears throat> and if you are a parent of young children, sometimes you even get a moment to yourself without being responsible for any of that stuff, because that can wear on you. But you know what? We all have to leave the bathroom sometime, and then those responsibilities are back. Excuse me. <coughs> Hopefully my voice doesn't cut in and out. For, for many people I know, y'all are walking through a, a season of life called grandparenting, right? Or great-grandparenting, for that matter. You have young grandkids, and every time you come around your friends, you want to share something. It's not a picture of your child, your adult child, but it's your grandbaby or your newest grandbaby or great-grandbaby. If you have young grandkids, there's always this urge to just pick them up and hold them in your arms and just love on them. And this is a normal reaction for people to have. But especially, it's very, very normal to have with your family members. It's very socially acceptable. But what about total strangers? People who are not in your family. What if an old man or an old woman comes that you don't personally know, wants to come up and hold your baby? Well, today's story, today's scripture, we're going to look at a situation just like that. Again, let's start at verse 21, Luke Luke 2, verse 21. It says, On the eighth day, when it was the time to circumcise him, him being Jesus, he was named Jesus, the name the angel was given, had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of, of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And... A sign will be spoken, a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, 
the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to, look, uh, excuse me, looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by law, by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Long passage, I know, but uh, very good nonetheless. <clears throat> the first thing that we notice here, and I just want to talk about passage, to be honest with you. I don't, I, I, I study the scripture and I'm like, oh, how, do, how can I, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I have these themes, these three points I want to make. I just want to look at this scripture with you today and see what we see here. What can we draw from what is being shown and what can pop up to us? Now, the first thing that I noticed is that Joseph and Mary were doing what the law required. They were obedient. The law of the Lord, interesting phrasing, is what Luke uses to describe what they were following. It says here, it says it there in the verses 23, 24, and 39. It uses that exact wording, the law of the Lord. A lot of times we talk about the Bible, so the, the law of Moses. Um, or the law of prophets, but the law of the Lord is very interesting that he says it here. And what are the things that they did for Jesus? Well, they uh, they circumcised him, naming the baby boy. That's very important moments in, in his life. Circumcision and being named. But he was named even before that. So that's just an interesting little tidbit as well. And then there was this time of purification where the family was waiting in a state of uncleanness. Uh, we see this, of course, here in this story in verse 22, but Leviticus 5.3 gives us some context, and we'll get into that chapter here in a few minutes. But we've got purification because after birth, uh, or after being born or assisting someone in birth, be basically becoming unclean, there's this time in which you had to stay unclean. At the end of that time, you were to go become purified. And so what we have here is a two-for-one special as they come to the temple uh, in Jerusalem. They go there to have Jesus consecrated and redeemed in the same trip because this was the soonest that they could do it because they were unclean up until this point. Now we have redemption. Another thing that that we uh, have them following the law because the Bible, and we'll talk about this here in just a sec, in Exodus, talks about bringing the firstborn male and consecrating it to God. Uh, Exodus 13, 12 through 15 reads, You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks you, What does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeemed each of my firstborn sons. But wait, you might be saying, I was following, I was paying attention to what the scripture said. Mary and Joseph offered birds, according to what the scripture says there. That's true. They offered birds. So let's look at the Old Testament prophet, prophet passage that connects with this. It's Leviticus 5, and then we're going to look at a couple key verses. So 5, 6, and 7, and then verse 11, all right? Tracking me? Leviticus 5. Verse 5 starts off, When anyone becomes aware of, and this came from the footnotes, by the way, Anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering. 
and the priest shall make atonement for them uh, for their sin. So that's where we get the lamb, the goat situation. But verse 7, anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin. One for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Verse 11, if, however, they cannot afford two doves or two young pigeons, they are to bring an offering for their sin, a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour for a sin offering. They must not put olive oil or incense in it because it is a sin offering. So the offering that we have here that they are to offer when they go is a guilt offering. Mary and Joseph offered this middle tier, what I'm calling the middle tier offering. I mean, there's this standard, which the first one you want is the lamb or the goat. The second one, if you can't afford that, we go down to the doves and the pigeons, or doves or pigeons. And then the third, okay, can, do you got some flour in your pantry? Can we can we make that happen? Um, they weren't completely destitute. They didn't have the low. They didn't have to go to the lowest tier, but they didn't possess just the basic lamb goat sacrifice. So I kind of indicate I take from this this one particular passage that they may have been not poverty stricken and mid, but rather more middle class for what that's worth. All right, so you've got your good Jewish family. They're doing good Jewish things as best they can with the resources that they have. They're following the customs written in the law of the Lord. It seems very typical. Another day at the temple, right? But this one special day, this little family had not one, but two run-ins with strangers fawning on their baby, over their baby in public. What was that all about? And how did the parents ultimately react? Well, let's look at these two people and talk about them for just a moment, what the scripture tells us about them. Because I'm calling them, they're the two witnesses to the Messiah, really. So let's talk about Simeon for a moment. Luke is, we talked about him being a doctor, but one of the things that uh, clues us in is the amount of details that he gives throughout his gospel. These are details that are not just helpful to fill out the story for you and I when we read it, to give us a clearer picture, but they're extra evidence that would be verifiable when his scripture was written. When the book of Luke was written, people were like, that detail's wrong. That's, there's too much detail there, Luke. You're messing, up. You're messing it up. No, he gives all this detail to actually lend weight to the story as well. So what do we learn about Simeon? Well, his name is Simeon. He's got a reputation, which is righteous and devout. We know his reputation. We know that Simeon, what he most wanted was the consolation of Israel. And we know his spiritual condition. At the time right there, it was the Holy Spirit was on him. That's good. Someone who's righteous and devout desires the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit's on him. One other detail that Luke became, became aware of and shares with us here is that Simeon had this personal revelation from the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever had like God spoke something specifically and directly and it came to pass or you know it right on you. It's not going to be transferring to somebody else like, well, everybody's going to have this. It's not a general word from the Holy Spirit. It's a specific word. That's what he got, that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. And Simeon was continually in the spirit. What did that help him do? It allowed him to be at the temple at the right place and the right time to meet up with Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. But here's the uncomfortable part. Maybe you cringed a little bit when I read it. Maybe not. Verse 28, he took... Jesus, he took, the, he took him into his arms. Simeon had a reputation. Great, he was righteous and devout. And as far as we know, he wasn't a priest. Not from this scripture, we're not led to believe that. But he was just a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And when a righteous and devout person wants to hold your baby in church, I guess you let them hold your baby, because that's what happened here. I don't know, I'd be a bit uncomfortable if someone came up and took my baby even in church, even if they're righteous and devout, because it just, it's uncomfortable. You don't have permission, but he did it. He didn't run away with the baby, he just held him. And Simeon, when he meets Jesus, 
he praises God. The first instance is to praise God. He declared, here, here, this baby, I feel a little bit like holding Simba up. I wish I had one of those baby dolls we've done before. But here, this, here is salvation in this here boy. Here's a light of revelation to the non-Jews. Here's the glory of the people of Israel. He brings salvation to the whole world. And I imagine as him, as Simeon handed Jesus back over to his parents, this is when he spoke the words of blessing on them. We're not given what that blessing is. But then they skipped over to him giving Mary some disturbing news about her son's future and about her own as well. And we never hear, hear this, we never hear about Simeon again in the New Testament. We're not told how old he is in this story, in this passage. It's implied, however, and a Christian tradition has, has continued this implication, that he was old based on the statement that you can dismiss your servant, but essentially the scripture doesn't tell us that. But he says, you can dismiss your servant, I can die now, God's word was fulfilled to me. You could say that at any age, but we like to think that he was old and he was waiting a long time. And then, maybe they've just come down off this high of like, okay, I've got my baby back. Let's like, let that guy go off. Right soon after that, we meet Anna, another witness to the Messiah. And Anna, we are told, interestingly enough, that she is very old. Uh, she, and, and the numbering is a little bit different. If you have footnotes, maybe it says this too, based on what was translated, and, but it could have been translated one of two ways, that she was 84, or that she lived for 84 years after her husband died. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit sticky here, but that she had been a widow for 84 years. So, But we know she's a widow. We know that she's the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher, and she's noted as a prophet, or depending on your translation, prophetess. Just means a girl prophet. That's really all that word means. Nothing different in the job description. And interestingly enough as well, Simeon wasn't called a prophet. So we have these two different people, and they both are witnesses to Jesus. We're told a lot of what Simeon says. What do we hear about and hear from Anna? We hear that she has never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. And then what was her reaction to meeting Jesus? She gave thanks to God. Simeon praised God. She gave thanks to God. And then we're just described what she did. She doesn't actually, we don't have written words of Anna saying this stuff, but it says that she told everyone who were looking forward to the redemption of Jesus, hey, here's this baby, this baby boy. That's what you're looking for. That's what you're waiting for. And then the thought struck me, okay, when I read that. She's sharing this good news with people who are waiting for something amazing to happen. And they say, hey, she's saying, hey, here's something amazing. Because the redemption of Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, Jesus was there in the temple fulfilling the law. What was he there fulfilling in the law? He was there to be redeemed according to the law. He was there to be redeemed. And it's interesting that Anna says, are you looking for redemption? Check out this baby. <laughs> are you looking to be redeemed? Here's Jesus. After all this excitement, what did Joseph and Mary and Jesus do? What do they do? They throw a big party, they hang out in Jerusalem, and they're like, oh, people talk about our baby all the time. No, they go back home. When I read that, I was like, they did what? Wouldn't you have been so excited you couldn't do anything else? No, they go back home. You see, they fulfilled the law requirements. They had two encounters with people who spoke wondrous things about Jesus. Some news was exciting, some news foreboding. And at the end of the day, they couldn't stay in Jerusalem. That was not their home. It was time to get back to daily routines. Christmas vacation around here, it's ending 
School's coming back in session, back to routines, early mornings, hello. Math problems, grammar lessons, but also getting to see some friends, having a normal dependable schedule that you can set your life to. Let's dip back into the scripture. Jesus and his parents returned home to their routines, their neighbors and perhaps even close family members. They returned to Joseph's customers waiting for a piece of handcrafted carpentry. They returned to some stability. Of course, Jesus was still a baby needing care from his mother. And Mary, trying to figure this whole thing out, becoming a wife and a mother and all in the same year, and needing, again, some stable home life because she had a lot on her plate. Today, right now, as we reflect on that wondrous interaction Jesus and his parents experienced, it happened to be in the middle of them consecrating him before the Lord, bringing their most precious possession and publicly acknowledging that he belongs not to them, but to God. That's what consecration is all about. And God made a way for the firstborn male to be redeemed. And so they start this new chapter in their life, regaining their child by recognizing the whole time that he is the Lord's. We see a semblance of this when we do baby dedications, right? We... We recognize the parents are stewards of this child. The child is the Lord's, and the parents are bringing that baby, that child, and recognizing that publicly. That is what they were doing in the temple that day. So my question for you, friend, are you consecrated like Jesus? Are you consecrated like Jesus? Have you given your whole self over to God, your life, your future, your family, your work, your home. Most importantly, let me say it a different way, does he have your heart? Know that God also redeems us. He has done it not through the blood of a lamb or a goat, not through the blood of a pair of pigeons or doves, not even through an offering of fine flour. He did it through the Lamb of God, through his Son, Jesus. So this week, perhaps, as you return to some routines, if you find those routines to be hollow and pointless, perhaps it's because you believe that they're yours and not the Lord's. And so today we say and we consecrate, Lord, my life, your life, we bring it before you. Our hearts are so much better in his nail-scarred hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come today and as we experience you, we get to know you, we rejoice, we praise you, God, and are thankful. We recognize today that you have made a way for us to be redeemed. You have made a way for us in your Son. And so we give you thanks and praise, but we have to publicly and personally come before you and lay our whole self down. My life is not my own. Everything that is attached to my life, it is all yours, who I am, what I am. Think I have. And Lord, you will give back to me what you feel like I can use and manage and, and do with. And you trust, just as you trusted Mary and Joseph you with Jesus, as they recognize that this child is the Lord's, and the Lord has given him back to us. You give us our lives back and say, now love and serve me. Introduce people to me. Make me what your whole life and your routine and your daily everything is all about. 
So Lord, as we begin to enter this new year, we pray that you, that it would be a year of consecration, constantly knowing and laying ourselves down before you so that you may redeem us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.